very virus called COVID-19 and God experience. I pray against them in Jesus' name that God you would help those who are engaged in the helping process. Bless our doctors and nurses and all the agencies. Give wisdom. Give courage. God, give know-how that God, this virus was the brought under control. Oh, we give it to you. You are Lord of America. You are Lord of the nations. But not only in America, but we pray, Father, for the healing of of the nations that pray for my island, or oh, in the, the Caribbean, Barbados, and God, all of the Caribbean. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would pour out your spirit. There are so many in our church from various nations. Why don't you call your nation? Why don't you call your people before God and say, God, bring healing. God, send help. God, bring blessing to the Philippines to the Congo, to Ghana, in the name of Jesus, Lord, to Jamaica, to Trinidad. I pray that you will send your blessings upon the, the government, so Lord, give wisdom and grace. God, I pray that you will bless, that you will pour your spirit out, that you will work wonders, that we, Lord, will reach out. We will be our brother's keeper. They will be coming together as we fight COVID, God, we place it in your hands for you, O Lord. Thank you for hearing us this morning. We ask, Father, that you would pour your spirit out upon Baltimore, the city of Baltimore, and the adjacent communities. Would you have your way today? Would you bless the church? Would you bless the leaders? At every level, bless them and use them for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord, for Asia, that there be a movement of your spirit, that you would have your way across that continent. Be glorified this morning. We pray, Father, for Edgewood Assembly of God, Pastor Brooke and Courtney, his wife, Courtney Hicks, anoint them, use them, bless them, as they serve in the community of Edgewood. Grant them strength. Lord, I pray you encourage their hearts. I pray that you will give them a vision. Lord, I just expand their horizon and use them to advance the cause of Christ. And Father, we will give you the glory. Bless the Lord or assembly, those that are in need and those that are struggling with issues. Oh God, whatever the issue, we lift it to you and ask that you will work your will. Now Lord, continue to walk with us and bless us and use us. May you be honored in everything that is said and done. God, we will give the glory and praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. wish that we could pray for every item that we have here. Praise the Lord. But God knows, God is in control. It might escape me, but it doesn't escape God. Praise this. Lord. Well, let's continue. Worship the Lord. I told you to come away to church this morning. And I heard a, a song that, that blessed me. Blessed me. The song is entitled, I Have a Reason to Praise the Lord. I Have a Reason to praise the Lord. Could I testify God indeed is, is wonderful? No, I can we are up to where the God tells us that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Amen. Testimony, testimony is glorified and honors God. So we praise him this morning. I was thinking about God's faithfulness and the many things that, that, that he has done. Uh, reasons that I can praise. You know, one of the first things that I, I was thinking of is I, I held on to the wheel and I watched the mother that I was holding on to the wheel. Uh, <laughs> coming here. I said, God, you know, I thank you for life. Yesterday I celebrated 74 years. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that, that came to God. I'm so glad. 
God for life. I don't feel it. No, shall be four or five, shall be four. And some more was speaking to me or speaking about me during the week. I think it was one of my grandsons that he said that granddad is 66. I was wow. Thank God he shaved off a few. <laughs> Perhaps I should go on before I get the trouble. But I want you to know that God in me is faithful and thank you for life and able, Lord, to walk and talk and think and recall all the blessings of life. Amen. My, 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 my senses are in touch. Amen. Feel. Amen. Amen. All these things that we take for granted, but God indeed has been working on our behalf. Not only in my behalf, but in your behalf. And brother, and let's, uh, let's uh, testify. Let's honor him. Let's worship him this morning. He's in charge. He's large and in charge of our lives. And so we pray, sir. Part of my prayer this week as I, 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 I came before the Lord in prayer, um, the words came at almost every time that I prayed, God of our day. That's how I approach God, God of our days. <laughs> I want you to know that He's the Lord of our days. Praise His name. Every moment, every moment is in His hands. And if you and I would approach God, let's remind ourselves that He's the God of our days. And the Word of God tells me Moses said it best as your days. So shall your strength be. Hear me? As your days, so shall your strength be. Claim that promise in your life. Amen. And I believe God is going to bless you. Well, I haven't started to preach yet. I think this is the body. We want to continue to approach or look at the subject of evangelism. And evangelism is from the Greek evangelio. It really means good news. The church, that's our responsibility. That's the reason for our existence, to be an evangel, to evangelize, to spread the good news that Jesus lives. John, just a little here on the mic, a little Jewish, maybe it's the monitors that, uh, that I am not here. Not, not too much. We don't want to overwhelm those who are here. But... Um, Let's give me a little more appreciating. Let's just give me a little more. That is how we speak in Barbados. <laughs> but but I, I hope that you, you understood me. Praise the Lord. We want to we want to look at the theme. We've been looking at the theme, looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. Our topic today is a love that expresses itself. In obedience. That's what I want to share. Looking at Jesus who's been the theme for the month, that is what it's like to inform our thoughts as we come and share God's word this month. But today's topic is a love that expresses itself in obedience. A love that expresses itself in obedience. And so, if you will, I want to read in your hearing again. Uh, 15 verse, and let's also read the 19th verse. Amen. I think it is the, the 19th verse. So let's read it, the 15th verse. The scripture says, in, and I was looking at chapter 15, that's why I didn't see it. Chapter 14 and verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my command. And the 21st verse is the verse that I want to read it as well. He who has my command and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I would love him and manifest myself. That's the promise of God. That's the word of the Lord. Those are 
the words that inform my topic this morning, a love that expresses itself in obedience. A love that expresses itself in obedience. Praise the Lord. Every now and then you know that I have to get my juice to bring it. A love that expresses itself in obedience. The 14th chapter of John's Gospel is a favorite the world over. And I believe it's because of the beautiful words that come. I preach many homilies or sermons over those who pass that have gone into eternity. And several times during that process, I've used this chapter to comfort those who are mourning. Well, not only me, but there are preachers, it's a favorite portion of preachers around the world, and, and people as well. It has brought a, a source of inspiration, a source of strength, and it has dried the tears of many around the world. But what brought these words of comfort about is that Jesus was responding to a question from Peter in the 13th chapter. If you go back and read the 13th chapter of of uh, uh, John's Gospel, you will see that Peter is asking the question. He's, he's asking the question because Jesus is coming to the close of his ministry on earth. He's about to go to the cross and lay down his life and die for the sins of the world. And so this is weighing heavy on. And soon after that, 40 days, the Word of God tells us he is going to leave and he's going to go back to glory. And so, uh, with the future of his mission in view, he is challenging his disciples with the words of our text. And the words of our text say, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Now, Jesus can say that. And I believe that, that it's fitting that he says that because he is Lord. You know, there are luminaries in our world who can't say this. Where they say anything like this? It will be out of it. But this is not out of it. Jesus is, 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 uh, Saying this because it's appropriate because of who he is. He's not on a, a, a ego trip here, but because of who he is, and because he knows that when we love him, we're going to live a right. Well, when we love him, we're going to treat our neighbor right. And husbands and wives are going to live right, and families are going to uh, hold it together. When Jesus is first, when he is loved, he is honored and respected. When he is Lord of our lives, and somehow we make our way, we are able to face challenges better, we are able to live better. And so that's why Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's uh, uh, the greatest commandment, Jesus says, as, as one person, as one lawyer acts, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, also, oh, love the Lord thy God. This is the Shema. Our Jewish brothers and sisters know this very well. The Shema is known. That's a part of their prayer as they go to uh, the synagogue, as they worship. But they would, they would say this, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And don't forget this problem. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Often we talk about loving God, but we don't think about loving our neighbor. If we don't love our neighbor, then we don't love God. But let's move on this morning. And so Jesus is responding to Peter. Because Jesus is saying to Peter that he is going to go away. And the disciples have walked with Jesus now. 
known for three and a half years, and they were concerned. They were alarmed that Jesus would say that, you know, for a little while, I will not be with you. That's what he says. For a little while, Jesus says, uh, I will not be with you. And so all of a sudden, this, this concern fell on them. They became alarmed. And so Peter stood up like he normally would and said, God, or Reverend Master, where are you going? Where are you going? And Jesus uh, began to speak the words that I read to you this morning. Uh, Peter also, or rather Thomas, also joined in as Jesus spoke about the fact that he was going away. He was going to go back to where he came from, go back to be with his father. And so Thomas joined in and said, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, teacher, would you show us the father? And Jesus says, uh, Thomas, have you been so long with me? And, and still you're asking a question? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And Jesus, uh, you know, began to encourage them. And, and here uh, he, he came to the statement, uh, let's jump ahead at the well and come to the verse, the verses that I want to speak to you on this morning. The scripture tells me that Jesus said to them, if you love me. Jesus is getting them ready now. If you love me, if you if you say that you love me, you demonstrate it by keeping my command. Demonstrate it by loving me. Demonstrate it by your walk and your talk. It's not enough to have a mental knowledge or get mental assent to truth or the things that I say. But I I, I want you. And, and may I say to you? that in the original text, in the Greek, if you will, uh, this is not a, a, an option, it's a command, it's an imperative. Jesus is saying, keep my commandments. And in the original, it really means you must keep my command. That's what it means in the original. If you love me, you must keep my commands. I know that that might offend some of us. Because, as uh, you know, we don't want to be told what we must do. But if you're going to follow God, if you're loving Him, uh, then uh, there are some things that we must do. Some things that we can escape. We must do what Jesus says in His Word. We must follow His commands, is what uh, uh, Jesus is saying to the disciples. And so, with this in mind, uh, Jesus spoke to to the disciples and say that you must, if you love me, keep my commandments. What are you saying, Pastor? You see, love was to be the new motive for the early disciples and all lives. If you love Jesus, if you if you uh, say that He is Lord, then it's important that love be. Anymore. You know how uh, the world operates, this dog eat dog mentality. You don't love me, I don't love you. You know, you don't care for me, I don't care for you. And so we uh, Bayesian word, if you, you, I, I, I am going to do doubly what you have done to me. But brother, with knowing Jesus and loving him, coming to him and coming unto his lordship, that's not how we live. That's not what rule or behavior or rules or behavior. Now we operate from the position of love. Love now must be uh, that new motive, that, that controlling uh, desire, if you will, of our living. And not only must love be our new motive, but obedience to Jesus must be the new standard. Obedience to Jesus must now be the new standard for all our activity. Whatever we do, we must be like, uh, I recall, 
uh, pastor in, in Cambridge in Massachusetts a number of years ago. I'm trying to recall the, I don't know if my daughter might remember the name. He was the, he was the, the, the principal of, is it Rangian Latin? No, it was the high school in Cambridge. And I don't know if you would recall with me, but he would, he would come and he, he would be sitting right at the front of the church. And, and, and at times I would, I would see him just weeping in the presence of God. And he would always use the words, so what will Jesus do? What will Jesus do when we will talk to him? I would talk to him one on one. He would ask the question, you, you, you know, you know the saying, it was made famous, I think, in the, in the 70s, what will WWD, what, the words, the acronym, what will Jesus do? And so, brethren, I think it's important that you and I allow uh, Jesus to direct our thoughts and to direct uh, uh, what we do. That ought to inform what we do. Before we go ahead and make a decision, we ought to consult Jesus and get his opinion, get his mind. What will he do? What will Jesus do? If he, were, if he were here and he had to make the decision, if, if he were present... What, what would be his decision? How, how would he go about doing so and so? I believe if you and I would live with that principle in mind, uh, our world would be a better place. Our families would be better. On the job place, it would be better. If that rule rules how we live, what will Jesus do? I believe in all of my heart that we would have the favor of God and our world would be a better place. And so, brethren, that must be the standard. Love must be the new motive, and obedience must be the new standard for all our activities. And so with that in mind, our text this morning is chock full of important truths, the portions that I have read. Let's look at three in particular. You've often heard me speak of the proverbial three. The first thing is seeing Jesus gives the follower of Christ an edge. When you and I follow Jesus, he gives us an edge. He gives us an edge. And two, a love that does not lead to obedience is inadequate. A love that does not lead to obedience is inadequate. And three, look into Jesus is life. Look into Jesus. His life. Now I know I might not get to all of them, they're there. Somehow I'm going to touch upon them with the help of the Holy Spirit. And would you pray for me that God's anointing will be upon me? I know, I know, I cannot do this without His help. And so God anoint me today and set me at liberty and give me the strength and give me a good recall and use me to be a blessing. I'll take my hands off of the glory and I'll give you the praise. In the name of Jesus. Praise his name. The first thought seeing Jesus gives the believer an edge. Seeing Jesus gives the believer an edge. You see, seeing Jesus is the distinguishing mark of the follower of Jesus. And it's the reason the Holy Spirit is given to the believer and not the world. It's the reason that the Holy Spirit has been given to the believer. If you have been following uh, the words that I have read to you this morning, the Bible tells us in the verses that I have read uh, the importance of being able to see Jesus. See Jesus not just with the physical eye, but with the spiritual eye. The Word of God tells me, and perhaps I ought to read it again in your hearing in John's Gospel, chapter 14. The Word of God tells us a little while longer, or rather, let's go back to the 15th verse. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another comforter, that He may abide with you, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. And why? Because it's him 
nor knows him. The world cannot receive the Spirit. The world cannot receive God's direction and God's blessings upon their lives necessarily because they do not see him. And this seeing, brother, then is a spiritual seeing we are talking about. We are not talking about a physical seeing here. We are talking about a spiritual seeing. The disciples were able to see Jesus. Seeing him differently as the Son of God, as beyond us, so to speak, as the one who came into the world to die to redeem us. We must have that special sight if we are going to experience experience the blessings of God upon our lives. In God's economy, we live by looking. We still live by looking. We still live by seeing. And I am not speaking about our physical eyes, nor with our physical eyes necessarily, although that's necessary. But I'm talking about seeing with that special sense, that sense that comes to us then we bow our knees at the feet of Jesus and invite him into our hearts and into our lives. We begin to see differently. We, we begin to act differently. We see our wives differently, our husbands differently, our jobs. Everything is different. Everything changes when Jesus comes into our lives. We begin to see as he sees and understand as he understands. And we give him the right to rule our lives. In the book of Numbers chapter 21 and verse 4 to 19, the word of God that tells us the children of Israel in their journeys, the journey in from Egypt to the promised land, the word of God tells us that they began to murmur. They began to complain. They longed for the food they enjoyed back in Egypt. And so they complained against the man of God, Moses. And because of that, God judged them and he sent fiery serpents among them. Where they were camp, and the snake, the, the, the serpent snakes, yes, uh, bit them, and many were dying because God uh, uh, somehow, you know, had blessed them, and they were not thankful. They began to complain and long for uh, the, the the things they enjoyed back in Egypt. They failed to recognize the blessings of God, and and if you will, it upset God. God was upset. Could God get upset? Yes. And so he sent fiery serpents among them. And they were dying. They were dropping uh, in the camp. And so they came to Moses. And they say, Moses, we want you to pray for us. We have sinned. We have, we have rebelled against God. We have failed to be thankful. And so God is judging us. Would you pray that God would, would somehow stop the judgment and he will, he will turn it or return it, his favor upon us? And so David, or rather Moses, went before God and prayed. And God said to him, to Moses, I want you to, to get a, a serpent or, or make us a, a brass serpent and place this brass serpent on a pole in the camp. And whoever sees, whoever a uh, sick person bitten by, by, by the, the, the fiery serpents, whenever they look upon a, that fiery serpent in a certain part of the camp, they will be healed. And so people who were bitten by uh, the serpents, they would come to the pole. Wherever they are, they would look upon the pole and they were healed. This was a foreshadowing of Jesus who would come into a world and who would uh, be hung on a cross, uh, on Calvary. And brother, when, when we look to him, when we trust him, when we turn to him, when we invite him into our hearts and into our lives, we become healed. No matter what sickness, no matter what we have done, where we have gone, uh, the sins we have committed, no matter how wicked we are, when we come to Jesus, when our eyes are open, when we look to Jesus, he comes into our hearts and into our lives and he changes us. Oh, no matter what we have done in our lives, Paul considered himself the chief of sinners, but he met Jesus 
and the grace of God will reach them and turn his life wrong. Hear me? When you see Jesus, it, it makes the difference. I often think of a man I met in the Caribbean on the island of St. Thomas years ago. It has to be 30 something years ago. I was preaching in Charlotte Emily, the capital of St. Thomas, running a series of services in the town there. And during that time, one man got angry with his girlfriend and pumped about seven or eight bullets in her chest and killed her. And he heard about the 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 revival. We call them revival and the, it, revivals in those in those days. I think they still do. And so after hearing, I visited the jail where he was located, and I sat with him and spoke to him about the love of God. Then I asked him if he would like to receive Jesus as Savior. And he said, me? Who, me? Would, would God accept me as his son, given what I've done? And I remind him of the Apostle Paul, how the Apostle Paul hounded down the church, hunted down the church, consented to the death of, of many. Scripture indicates that the Paul consented to the death of the first martyr of the church. You know who the first martyr was? Stephen. Paul stood up over Stephen as they saw him, uh, 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 as they stoned him to death. Paul was engaged in that activity, but he met Jesus. And I told him that if Jesus can do it for Paul, he will do it for you. And I recall that man bowed his head and I invited Jesus to come into his life. And brother, when I haven't seen him since and I don't know where he is at, he might still be alive. But if he's been walking with God, I want you to know that one of these days when Jesus makes up his jewels, he'll be there. God forgives regardless of where you are, what you have done, where you have gone, and how far in the muck and mire of the world you are when you see Jesus. When you invite him into your heart and into your life, he comes in and he changes you from the inside out and he makes your life over and new. Paul says it well in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. If any man or woman be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. That's what happens when Jesus comes in, when we see Jesus. I want you to know faith is still the medium by which life comes to us from our life-giving Savior. When we look to Him by faith, when we see Him by faith, when we understand who He is. And so the Word of God tells me that the world in Jesus' day and in our day could not receive because they were not seeing Jesus. When we see Jesus, he makes the difference. Our daily motto should be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The Apostle Paul put it this way, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loves me and gives himself for me. Let's move on. Just as important as what I just said, seeing Jesus is not just a one-time thing. We must not just see Jesus when we invite him into our hearts and into our lives and forget about it. Some Christians are like that. They saw Jesus when they first surrendered their life to Christ, and that's the last time. You know, sometimes we see Jesus only on Sunday morning, and we forget him on Monday morning. We forget him upon on Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday. But brother, in seeing Jesus is a continuous thing. We must constantly look to him, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 
all the disciples received the blessings of God. Why? Because they saw Jesus. I'm here to say to you this morning, we must see Jesus. We must surrender to him. We must understand who he is and his role in our lives. And when we see him, we see problems differently. When we see him, we see situations differently. We see with his eyes and we see or as he sees and we're able to handle what comes, the challenges because we do it in his strength. We do it with his help. We do it with his blessings upon our lives. Let's move on, if you will, in Christ. Love leads to obedience. In Christ, love leads to obedience. Love for Christ is very concrete. We talk about love these days. And the word love is not like in the Greek. In the Greek, there are four or five different words for love. In the English language, there's only one. And so we love ice cream and we love pizza and we love soup and we love this and love we love everything uh, and sometimes our love is a puppy love you know what I mean but love for Jesus is concrete the love that we're talking about here is a concrete love it does not lead if it does not lead to obedience it is inadequate if love for Jesus doesn't lead to obeying him, then our love is inadequate. In other words, it's insufficient. Amen. Could you imagine loving your wife or husband without showing it? No, you can't. If you love, you're going to show it. You're going to do the things that demonstrate it. You're going to never do what you do or whatever you do. It's going to be an indicator. I I'm doing it and sometimes you don't say it. But uh, uh, the very act demonstrates or indicates that you love. And so, Brother Lynn, uh, I I'm here to say to us this morning, beginning with me first. In Christ, love leads to obedience. There is a connection between love and an obedience and so the word of God tells me if you love me keep my commandments love is the test of discipleship the word of God tells me Jesus says by this shall all men know the world as they look on and for the first three centuries you know uh, century one century two and century three the first three centuries of the Christian church uh, the motto was oh how they love one another that's what was said of the church the unlooking world in rome and uh, syria and different parts of the the roman empire that's how they describe the church oh how they love one another oh it's my prayer that that would be said of word of life Amen. that it be said of your home that you have a testimony of love, that, that you love your, your spouse, and you love your children, and you love your neighbor. Our lives, brother, when I want you to know, the scripture tells us that love is the test of discipleship. Love is the test of someone who knows and follows Jesus. If you know him, if you love him, if you've seen him, you're going to love it's going to be the characteristic, the dominant characteristic of your life. You're going to love, and your love is going to be concrete. Your love is going to be genuine. Your love is going to be demonstrated with action, if you will. In Christ, love and obedience are linked, inextricably linked. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, and verse 23 and 24, perhaps I ought to take the time of reading. Let's hear 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. And the 24th verse, He who does not love me, does not keep my words. 
And the word of which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. What do you gather from that? I gathered from that several things, but one of the first things that I gathered is that, that the, if we love God, loving God, or God is going to accept us if we accept His Son. God is going to love us if we love His Son. And so our love for God is contingent upon our love in Jesus. Now we can debate that at another time, but it's important that you and I recognize the Son. If you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, and brethren, we have to demonstrate it by how we do, how we act. Jesus says, Thou shalt love me with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength. Are you ready for this? Some people say it's a tall order. You know what Jesus is calling for here? He is calling for us to love him beyond all else. To put it first. How does that look like? How does that, how the love, the love of Jesus, how can I put it in concrete terms? Jesus expects us to love us, love him even before we love our spouse. Even before we love that son or daughter. And you know how dear they are to us. You know how much uh, we hold to them and love them. They're important in our lives. But the love, the kind of quality of love that Jesus is calling for is that we put him forward first. I recall when I first met my wife, spouse, then I met her in Trinidad. We were, we were in the, the Bible school there, and we were sitting in the, in the cafeteria, and I was on one side of the cafeteria, and she was on the other side, and of course, you know the chemistry, you know how it goes. You don't need me to tell you anymore. <laughs> but that's when we met, there was a certain chemistry. But I recall when we were dating, I said, you know, I'm going to put Jesus first in, my, in our lives. He comes first. And if you put Jesus first, I guarantee you your wife is not going to come last. If you really mean this. If you put Jesus first, I guarantee you that your son or your daughter will not come last. But somehow, the love for Jesus is going to inform how you treat your wife, how you treat your spouse, how you treat people. Your love for Jesus, I guarantee you, you love better. You'll appreciate them more. You'll treat your son and your daughter better when you love Jesus first. I want you to know that Jesus is not on an eager trip. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. And his love is not selfish. His love is, is a, an agape love, if you will. His love is a given love. His love goes beyond the limits, if you will. His love is a sacrificial love. His love, he puts his life on the line for us. The Word of God tells us that Jesus loves us. And he gives himself for the church. That's the kind of love that Jesus loves with. And that's the standard for the child of God. As a matter of fact, in the marriage vows, or at least when I counsel, often tell the couple, that the, or particularly the husband, I will speak to him and tell him, you know, sir, the standard for your love for your wife is, is like Jesus' love for the church. If you can love Jesus, love your wife like Jesus loved the church. You know how Jesus loved the church? He loves the church so much that he gave himself for it. 
And so you must have that kind of, of sacrificial love. I want you to know this is something, bro. But I, but I tell young couples that, particularly 20 and, and 21 and 22, they, they, you, you, you don't react, you know, in a visible fashion, but you could see it affects them. Who you expect me to love my wife like that? <laughs> and I know it's, it's kind of t- a tall order, but it grows. As you surrender to God, as you walk with God, and as you live with your spouse, your love gets better and better and stronger and stronger. And it becomes an inextricable link. Uh, brother, they hear me this morning. That's the standard. Perhaps I ought to move on because some of you might be getting a little fidgety and say, Pastor, move on. But I challenge us this morning. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And one of the commandments is that you and I love each other. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have love one for another. In Christ, love and obedience are linked. Obedience is the indicator that we love Jesus. What does obeying Jesus look like, you ask? What does it look like? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. For starters, it means having a close walk with God. What does obeying Jesus look like, you ask? I'm glad again you asked. For starters, It means having a close walk with God. A daily study of the Word of God. You're going to give priorities to the Scriptures. If you love God, amen. You want to know His Word. You want to study His Word. You want to take time. And I know that we have competing, uh, you know, entities in a world that compete for our time. And particularly in the world in which we live and in America, where there is this dog-eat-dog rush to keep food on the table and to uh, sustain ourselves. Oh, it, it competes against our time. But I often say, if you're too busy to take time for the Word of God, you're too busy. If you're too busy to get on your knees in prayer, you're too busy. Oh, there is something about getting aside with the Word of God and just saying, God, open my eyes and help me to see the Word of God just leaps out of the pages, if you will, and wraps its itself around your heart and around your personality and it informs your behavior and it gives you a pep in your step because you know the promises of God. You know that God is with you. You know what God says in his word and the Holy Spirit uses the word to strengthen and to nourish our spirit and to help us when we are down and to give direction and meaning and purpose to our lives. And so, brethren, it's critical that we take the time ah, daily to study the Word of God. Consistent prayer is important. The same thing must be done with Jesus. We must take the time. If we say we love Him, then we, are, we ought to wait on Him. We ought to come into His presence on a daily basis. That's, brethren, that's how we are made. That's how we take Oh, you and I cannot function particularly in the society in which we live with the stresses and the challenges of a modern day living. You and I, some people are pulling the hair out, particularly in these times of COVID, and they're falling apart at the slightest thing that comes into their lives. They're having a pity party, and they, they, they're overwhelmed, and they fall into depression. Here need a way out of depression is to trust Jesus. The way out of your challenges is to walk with Jesus. Jesus. I was telling my grandson a few days ago, I know the time is going, telling my grandson something had just happened suddenly in my grandson's life and he came to visit with us. 
But I said to him, life can be difficult. Yes, things happen. And very often, they just happen all of a sudden. Life happens. Things come into our lives that shake us to the core. And if we are anchored, if we are not anchored, we can fall apart. If not, we are not anchored, they have to call the people with the white suits for us. If we are not anchored, if we if we don't have that anchor, if we don't have that stability, if we don't have that 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 you know that gives us the ability to fight on, to move on. Reminds me of a story of a young man and his mother would constantly ask him about Jesus, and she would say as he would come into uh, the home from day to day. She every now and then would ask the son, "Do you love Jesus? Are you walking with him?" And he would, he would just brush her off. You know, when you're young and you have the world as a kite, like on a downward pull, and you feel that you're Iron Man and. You know, you're not going, nothing can happen. Nobody can reign in your parade and you feel that you have it made in the shade, as they say. And so, uh, you always feel that, that, that the world is, is your, they say, oyster. <laughs> I want you to know, brother, ben, that, that she would constantly ask him as he would come from time to time. Spirit of God move upon her. She would be the good parent and say, Son, do you love Jesus? Do you know him? And he was brushing off. And brother, when he, every now and then, she would say, Son, you're going to need Jesus. You're going to need Jesus. Hear me this morning, sir. Do you know him? Do you love him? I told my grandson, you're going to need him. You're going to need Jesus. You're going to need him as an anchor. Oh, I've been out in the ocean several times. I love fishing. And I've been out there in Chesapeake Bay several times fishing. But we would throw down the anchor, and the anchor would keep us from going all over the place. It became an anchor, if you will. It brought stability. Hear me, Jesus brings stability. That's what I'm saying. He's an anchor. Oh, and the word of the Son says, in times like these, you need an anchor. In times like these, you need an anchor. Your anchor ought to haul and grip the solid rock. And the Son goes on to say, this rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Do you know in this morning? I'm going to close. Go to the last point I want to make. Look into Jesus. It's life. On the cross, Jesus offered himself as an atonement for our sin. He will never die again. <laughs> I, I love that. When I was studying in it, I just got a, I just got a, a shot of vitamin E, if you will, up and down my spine. When I read that, that Jesus died and he will never die again. Amen. His death was acceptable to God. Amen. His death was paid a price. Yeah. Amen. The Word of God tells us that when He gave His life, ah, when He surrendered on the cross, ah, it was acceptable with God. And today He sits at the right hand of the Father. We don't have time to explain that, but that tells me that His sacrifice was acceptable. That tells me Jesus says it is finished. Ah, when He hung His head and died, it was acceptable.
even went about uh, the service in the tabernacle of the temple. He never sat down, but Jesus, when he offered himself, it was acceptable that God, and he sat down. It speaks to the fact that God is pleased with what Jesus did. It's the answer to your life and to my life. Jesus will never die again. What are you saying, Pastor? His life becomes our life when we put our trust in Him. Amen. And becomes the guarantee to us that we shall live also. Oh, I don't have the time to really expound upon this. But Andre Crouch in the 70s and the early 80s used to sing a song and because he lives or he lived I can face tomorrow. Amen. Because he lives, all fear is gone. That song speaks powerfully to Christ's victory. Amen. To Christ's victory and ours over death. I told you a little while ago that <laughs> I have had the privilege of laying many people in six feet under. Some I've done in sorrow and some I've done with joy. Because I know, <laughs> I know that if you die in Christ, we can say, go ahead and bury me. I shall rise again. For the word of God tells me, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ shall rise. That's my faith. That's what I believe. That one of these glorious days, Jesus is going to break the clouds of glory. And when he comes, I'm going to be changed. Bless his name. I believe that you have that hope. That hope that we have in Jesus. He is the answer. He satisfied the demands of God's justice. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 18, tells us when he saw Christ, John went on the Isle of Patmos. When he saw Christ, he fell at his feet as dead. He was overwhelmed. This is not the first time throughout the scriptures when people saw a theophany or they saw God in some fashion. They couldn't stand it and so they, they fell on their faces. John says that he, he fell as dead. But Jesus came to him. I was reading it yesterday. And the scripture tells us that Jesus placed his hand. Read it for yourself in Revelation 1 and verse 18. Jesus placed his hand on him and said, John, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't be afraid. And it goes on. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever Hallelujah. and I hold the key yes. Yes. I hold the keys of death amen oh that's reason to shout that's reason to rejoice Jesus has the keys of death it means he has the authority over death but you and I fear that you and I dread but Jesus conquered death he has of death and Hades, if you will. He has the authority. He's able to call us from the dead like he called Lazarus. You remember when he stood up out of the grave, the tomb of Lazarus who was, had died for four days and his body was thinking. The scripture tells us that when he heard the voice of God, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And all of a sudden that body was that was filled with rigor mortis. All of a sudden the veins, ah, blood started to course warm in the veins and the heart. 
began to partake again, to pump blood again. I want you to know the body became alive again. The eyes ah, came alive. And Lazarus was lying there. And the scripture tells us, Jesus said to those that were wrong, loose him and let him go. He has the power over death. Amen. And that's the one I trust. That's the one my confidence is in. Oh, I feel like the songwriter. I know my help is coming this morning. You remember the songwriter says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean. On Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground, all of the ground is sinking sand. As I close this morning, like the bronze serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man was lifted up, that whosoever believes in him shall have life. How does this connect? The 14, looking on Jesus. And with for focus evangelism, brother, when we have good news, the church has good news. That's why I'm a Christian. That's why I believe Jesus. Don't want to disparage Islam. Don't want to disparage Buddhism. Don't want to disparage Judaism. Or any of the religion. But if you go to Mecca, you'll see a tomb with Muhammad, and he is lying there. And if you go to the religions of the world, they don't have a living Savior. They don't have a Christ that came out of the grave. Christianity has a Christ who died. But lives. He, he conquered death yeah. and hell and the grave. That's the one I put my trust in. That's the one I believe. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. We need to tell the world. We need to tell your neighbor, your family member. This is one of his commands. Go ye into all the world. And preach this good news that Jesus is. God wants us to see His Son Jesus, and in seeing Him, we have life. Yeah. Bow your head with me. Close your eyes. John, if you would put that song on for us, and we're going to hear borrow two, and I'll come back and pray.
such a good selection, man. We appreciate it. A good song. Jesus in the center. Just, just allow it to play in the background, John. Do you love it? Is he the center of your world? Is he the center of your life? You're going to need him. You're going to need him. You're going to need him. Are you trusting him? Is he Lord of your life? Why don't you make him Lord? If somehow you've slipped, if somehow you've gotten careless and indifferent, you lost that sense of his presence. Church doesn't mean what it used to mean. The Word of God doesn't mean what it used to mean. Prayer doesn't mean what it used to mean. But you need that revival. Somehow you have become earthbound, earth centered, going after stuff at the expense of your own spiritual life. Will you come back and say, God, you're the center of my life? Make him center. Oh, glory. Spirit of God, go out over the airways, over YouTube, and use this word. Use it more. Use it. Use it in. Use it in Miami. Use it in Tobago. Use it here in Baltimore. Use it. Use it. Use it wherever the word is heard today and tomorrow and the next day. Use your word. Use your word to change lives. Use your word to heal and to redirect. Use your word to encourage, to destroy the works of the enemy. And to set free lives that are wrecked. Bring healing. Open our eyes to see Jesus. Help us to love him. Give us that spirit of obedience. Help us not only to love, but to obey. And to demonstrate our love by our obedience. I pray you'll bless word of life. God, encourage hearts today. Awaken all our, our spirits, our minds. Oh God, grant that that love that seal for you would be rekindled. And God, because of COVID and or lack of, Lord, coming together and fellowship, and we know that the healing, you will bring nourishment to our spirit. You will strengthen us. God, go out to your children. Visit us today. Visit us with your glory. Come upon us. Quicken us. Give us a get up and go. Be the anchor of all lives. Help us to live for you. Not in a tepid fashion. Not in a mediocre fashion. But with a sense of destiny and commitment. Help us to love you and walk with you and serve you. Oh God. I beg of you today to revive hearts. Defeat the enemy. All that is carnal and earthly. The weights that hold us back. Calls them to fall. Forgive us of a renewed love for you. Help us, my Father, to live for you. Help us to hear your word. If you love me, keep my command. In Jesus' name, amen. John, if you would keep playing that song, raise it a little for me. Let us all hear it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those of you in your homes and even in the church here, let's take a moment and rededicate and recommit. 
Ask God to open our eyes that we see Him clearer. We love Him more. We honor Him be beyond all else. Beyond all else. We put Him first. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Help us to love you. Help us to love you. Help us to serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. We're going to transition. Take the Lord's tithes and your offerings. Thank you for giving, standing with us. Because of your giving, of course, today is Mission Sunday. We give to support our missionaries and the organizations that we support. We have not failed. Each month we have stood with them. Fulfill our commitment. And so let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing it. I have my offering here and I have my missions here. I do it faithfully every month. I promise that I'll do it until Jesus comes, as long as I'm your pastor. And so please give as you give. Those of you who are at home and those of you who are in the sanctuary, if you would come one by one, let's still observe COVID distance. It is still affected by this virus. So let's do what we have to. Amen. Keep your mask on. I'm going to put mine on just now. But let's come and give. Praise the Lord, if you will. good sound, John. we bring these gifts to you and we thank you for loving us. We bring them out of devotion not because that we are forced to but we bring them out of love because you love a cheerful giver. Thank you for the faithfulness of your children. I pray your blessings on them and their homes. Bless them on their jobs. Keep them in good health. Protect them as they travel from day to day. 
And God, we consecrate these gifts to you. Use them to tear down the strongholds of the enemy. And to establish your kingdom in this community and around the region. And even around the world. Bless our missionaries. Bless these gifts. Keep them in good health. God, I pray that you will make them successful. Give them souls. Oh, God, send people in their lives that will rally and be supported. Help them not to be discouraged. When they're lonely, I pray that you will be the companion. You would encourage their hearts. And you would continue to use them. Thank you for hearing us, Lord, as we give our gifts to you. In the name of Jesus, with thanksgiving. Amen. If you haven't given your missionary gift today, a pledge, you will do it before the end of the month. We would appreciate it. The Lord bless you as you continue to stand with us in reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus. That's what evangelism is all about. Amen. I want to remind you of one or two announcements this coming Tuesday or is going to be your time of prayer from 7 to 8. Sister Josie is here. She leads this along with Sister Catherine. We thank them for this service to God and to the church. The Lord bless them. And then Wednesday we continue our study. It might be the last. I'm not sure. But we go into Revelation 21 as well as 22. We've reached that stage of hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's what the word hallelujah means. Praise the Lord. But it's a time of the triumph of God. We believe that we are going somewhere. That life is linear and not circular as many believe in times past. And by linear I mean that we have a beginning and we're going to have an ending. And the ending is going to be in glory. Amen. Oh Lord Jesus is going to come. We believe that. And that's what Revelation 21 and 22 are all about. Join us and study with us. As we bring Revelation, the study of Revelation to a close. Hopefully it might be this week, we're not sure. Um, but we're going to go get as far as we can. As we look into Revelation 21 and chapter 22 as well. Um, let me see if there are other items that we should bring to your attention. Um, no. Praise the Lord. I was thinking that, that um, well, it is next week that we are going to be celebrating anniversaries and, and birthdays. I wonder why I remember the birthday. Maybe it's because that I celebrated my birthday yesterday. Amen. Well, <laughs> that is self-serving. And I try not to be self-serving. <laughs> but I can't help it. I am human. Bow your head with me, please. Father, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend in your presence. Thank you for your word. Lord, may your word, long after we have left your house, continue to do us good. Bless us this day, those of us in the sanctuary and those at home. God, will you minister to us, go with us, go before us, protect us in the highway. Give us favor of the job. Help us to walk in obedience and honor you and love you. And God, uh, 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 do what you say according to your word. If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh God, help us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And a spirit or a mind to understand. That we might glorify you in all, all that we do. Be with us now, we pray, Lord. For we ask these things through Christ, O oh Lord. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Go with God. Because I believe God is going to go with you. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's